We would be honored if you would join us. Welcome to Unmistakably Star Wars, your source for a high-quality, informative, and entertaining look into the Star Wars galaxy. So, Rebecca's and Jason's son, Silas, yeah. is going to have his fourth birthday party coming up. It's <laughs> October. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be a Star Wars theme party. So, uh, part one here is obviously they've raised their son right so yes, far. Yes, yes. But then he is actually taking the liberty of assigning people <laughs> what to come dressed as. It's not just a Star Their son. Their son is like- Their, their four-year-old son that oh, sounds is like, assigning. That sounds like Silas. Yes. He's assigning. So he gave my daughter, who just turned five, the chance of either being Ray or Captain Phasma. Wow. And all we've known in this household has been Ray. Ray, yeah, yeah, Ray, yeah, Ray, yeah, Ray, yeah. Ray, Ray. Except for my obvious affinity <laughs> for the captain. <laughs> for Captain Phasma. Yeah. And- um. So I asked her, who do you want to be? And I thought it was going to be, it was going to be Ray. Yeah, why down. not? And, and she said, Captain Phasma. Whoa. And I was taken back. And I said, well, why do you want to be Captain Phasma? And she said, well, because, Daddy, she gets to tell all the boys what to do. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just like, talk about raising someone right. Raising someone right. <laughs> Hopefully, of course, yeah. that during the party game, she doesn't actually get stuffed into a trash can. But well, yes. Right. Yeah. We don't want to Hope. live out TFA. No, 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 no. But the whole bossing stormtroopers around, yes. I'm, 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 I would, that would be fun to watch. Take, takes after her mother. <laughs> <laughs> Let's edit that out. Yes. It, I'll edit that later. Um, <laughs> No, you won't. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> well, welcome to Unmistakably Star Wars. It's Man, it's been a while since we've been in the studio. I'm getting the gang back together. I know. We're actually in the studio. We've been kind of on location filming yeah. and bad classrooms with bad sound and, and all that stuff. So it's good to kind of have the gang back together. I'm Jeremy. I'm joined by Devin. Greetings, Tauntauns. And Barb. Hey, guys. So uh, we got a few announcements, Devin, just uh, about what's going on in the show. A couple of exciting things. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the spring... And never really came to full fruition like yeah. we had hoped. But uh, we're going to launch it this fall. And that's when we're going to have an occasional series. We'll launch it as a separate podcast uh, probably on Thursdays, at least probably every other Thursday for uh, as, we, as we push off from the dock here. But we're entitling Star Wars on Tap. And really the heart of this entire uh, series is to sit down and hear about people's Star Wars stories. Yeah. Yeah. Just a super casual conversation with the everyday fan to find out what does Star Wars mean to you and why. Yeah. So we're kicking things off this Thursday. We've got a great interview lined up with Sarah Gazelle from mm -hmm. the great country of Texas. <laughs> and uh, Great nation of Texas. The great nation of yes. Texas. And she is a hoot. She is um, so much more well-read in the Star Wars universe than I could ever hope to become. Mm. And it was... Just a fun time sitting down with her. So that's coming this Thursday. We're going to continue to uh, release more episodes of Star Wars on Tap. And then, you know what? If anyone listening is interested, we want to hear your Star Wars story. Absolutely. So DM us on Twitter. Say, sign me up. I want a little Star Wars on Tap. We'll get a hold of you, and we will make that happen. Yeah, and you'll be on the podcast. You'll be on the podcast. Yeehaw. All right, well. That's good. And in terms of the articles, we have a few things coming out. One we, we mentioned recently just about – we, uh, we had Grant on the show last week, which right. was fun to have him on. He's been writing for us for months, so it was awesome to get one of our writers that rarely shows up on the podcast to right. hop on. It was his first time. And we, we had this conversation about death in Star Wars, and uh, we have an article coming out soon just ab about part of that conversation. Some of you have actually chimed in on Twitter about should the Rogue One cast die. And so we're going to actually have an article about that uh, coming up, along with an article about today's big topic, our closer look topic. Uh, and we'll mention that in just a minute. But really, on today's show, we, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the news and what we've been, you know, hearing all over the all over the web recently. You know, one is about this the meaning of the Rogue One title. We'll be talking about 
<sighs> Yet another Ray theory. Ray and, theory um, number 473. Yeah, gosh. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, de- the Death Star might show up. <laughs> The make Death Star an, might show up. Make an appearance. <laughs> is it is it on Say our hi. radar? Is it, is it it's, looming? It's coming. It's coming. Wow. I um, would have totally maxed my credit card had I known that. <laughs> hey, and we'll, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the prequel Strike Back documentary mm. uh, that will be releasing on DVD and digital on September 14th, but then again in the theaters in Austin on October 6th, Austin, Texas. Uh, and then also we're going to be going to our Closer Look segment, which is really about changing perceptions and changing perspective, and you can even maybe say changing opinion. Um, and we'll specifically be talking about our own opinions of things or perspectives of things within Star Wars, which would include the prequels. And so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Uh, so that's kind of the rundown of our show. We're excited that you guys are joining us, and we will get kicked off right after this break. I have good news for you, my lord. That's so interesting. Wait, there's something very weak coming through. So Empire Magazine recently had uh, this is their feature article. I mean, it's a feature cover story article about Rogue One. Have you guys seen these covers that have been floating around out there? Yeah, I looked at the link that you sent. So yeah, it's for some sweet covers, man. I have you ever bought an Empire Magazine? Either one of you? No, I, I used to. You know, I don't even know where to find them. Quite well, frankly, we're such well like, a long world. time ago. There used to be bookstores i've heard of these <laughs> did, did you not hear more. my fiasco trying to find <laughs> yes. the entertainment Weekly? well yeah i still never found well, it well you know there were when i was living in st louis before I, I moved here to to sunny california i um it was not always sunny in st louis so i found myself sunny often in philadelphia <laughs> yes right <laughs> that's right and hey, so i would go to like borders and stuff like that. that's when i was in grad school but in you know borders and barnes and noble these kind of big bookstores that are really kind of non-existent now yeah occasionally i'll see a, a barnes and noble but um, they would have a lot of the import magazines from England, you know, like um, Mojo, which did music, and then like um, Empire, which did film. And I would, I would occasionally, if I had enough money, because they're pretty expensive, mm. I would grab an Empire magazine. It's worth it, man. They're it's one of the best movie magazines, period. Yeah, and so it's cool to see, you know, just this this magazine hit the shelves, if you can find it, hit online. Uh, and just the, the they're focusing on Rogue One. There's a bunch of different uh, you know covers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what was interesting in the magazine was that Gareth Edwards made some some comments about the mm-hmm. Rogue One title. Yeah, and we've been kind of batting around like, what does this mean exactly? You know, I think a few weeks ago I said that 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 Jen Urso was Rogue One. Right. Um, and you know we were talking about that. And and here's a quote from that article just about the title. And, and Edward says, um, said in it, I'd been thinking about it. He reflects in the new issue of Empire. What does it mean? Rogue One is a military call sign to some extent. Uh, he referred to the Red Squadron in the Battle of Yavin. Right. Uh, but this is the first film that's kind of gone off script or gone off the normal trajectory. And uh, that's not part of the saga. Um, or you can call it the Anakin story. Um, so it's the Rogue One, you know? And so that was kind of his comments about the title. Uh, I'm just curious what you guys thought about just what he thinks about about what this is, what this title is. Yeah, like I, calling the title the Rogue One because it's not part of the saga. <laughs> that That's cute. Bravo. Yeah. Slow clap. Yeah. Um, yeah, I... I don't know if it refers to like the the military terminology or not. I mm-hmm. I really have a hunch that this is going to play much more closely in line with like Mark Wahlberg's film Lone Survivor. Yeah, and it's yeah. going to more refer to there's going to be one person left. Oh, at mm-hmm. the end of the film. Yeah, Jen, maybe we'll see. Yeah, not convinced that it's her, but potentially. That's how I like that. We'll I like see. that. I like that Lone Survivor concept, and uh, yeah, I. Again, it goes back to: Are we going to get these guys? Are they going to make it right. through this film? Right. Is she the is she the rogue one that survives? I don't know. What are your thoughts, Barb? I I always interpreted the title as the military one that mm. yeah. Edwards talks about, and 
as we've seen previews and get to know some of the characters, um, I more looked at it as the entire group Mm -hmm. that goes to steal the Death Star plans. I'm always thinking ahead, um, knowing that this movie ends like 10 minutes before A New Hope and thinking ahead to how... You know, this is that group. Um, I know Jyn Erso is the main character of that, but um, yeah, I just and as he refers to, you know, Red One and from Yavin and mm-hmm. that kind of thing, Rogue One sounds exactly like that. Yeah, and the the other little like it could be or what Edwards talks about is actually you know further down in the article he he says you know there's another meaning um, that it, not just that Jyn Erso is is a military call sign rogue one but she's the, she's a rogue mm-hmm. right so you know it's that kind of idea that she has this rogue streak in her yeah. um sort of that touch of han solo maybe um that that kind of drives her propels her you know compels her to do what she does um perhaps there is a duplicity of meanings Ooh. Oh, i'm mm-hmm. sure there is <laughs> but uh, again like i just always felt like that title, even the rogue part, was was for this group of people. They're yeah. going against the Empire. You know, that that alone is rogue. Yeah. Maybe I am thinking more not as creativity creati- creatively yeah. as everybody else is, but Yeah. Yeah. I you know, it's it's interesting as we get closer and closer and I think we'll see stuff in September and you know, especially late September when we get to that that Force Friday event. Yeah. Um, we're just going to get more info, you know, more tidbits, more things. I mean, we're already seeing images of the toys coming out. That's pretty exciting, but also it's giving away some of the story as well. Um, oh, well, I'll tell you that we were we were driving home yesterday from a baseball game up in San Francisco, and we have the original 12-inch LP, the story of Star Wars, yeah, yeah. right? Digitize that. And that's called the original actors and voices and sound effects in that. Yeah. And just when I I started, it was in the background, but just some, I'm kind of following along and to hear Darth Vader as he comes onto the Tantive four and talk about the plans that they beamed here and what Mm -hmm. happened to the plans they sent you. And it just, it got my juices going for even more just going like, Oh my gosh, we're going to actually see this play out. We are, we are. And, and they're, Everything we've seen, we're yeah. happy. I mean, yeah. it seems to be, you know, in despite all of the, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, all of the set problems or reshoots yeah. or this person's editing the film and this right. dire- and Gareth is not, Gareth Edwards is not a part of, you know, there's all been all this noise, yet every time they're showing us what's going on, I've not been bummed out about right. it. So, right. So, right. Uh, we'll see. I mean, it's going to be fun. I mean, we're getting more and more stuff. The novels will start rolling out in November. We'll get, you know, Catalyst, I think, happens October, mid-November. I believe. Is yeah, well, October? November 15th is Catalyst. I oh, think October. Correct it. <laughs> October is Ahsoka. Ahsoka. So Ahsoka comes out in October. So we're, we'll get, you know, we'll start getting this stuff coming out soon. And it's really going to, it's going to be fun to start playing in that that sandbox of this time period. In fact, I'm reading rereading Tarkin right now. Um, mm. One of our listeners um, and writers, Franklin, uh, he just pointed out like he was doing that and he brought up a quote that we'll bring up on a future episode from the novel Tarkin. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to have to Go read it. When, in, well, what I did it. was I, I had a I had a credit for Audible and, and so I got the uh, the the audio version of Tarkin and started listening to that and I'm, I'm about uh, two, two-thirds of the way through. Right. So it's been a lot of fun to go back through it. Um, so another story and one that, that if you're not careful, you can get really tired of. And w- one of the things that we're seeing right now is there's this lull in the news cycle. And even though there's still news coming out, and what I mean by a lull is you kind of have these repetitive stories come back around sure. and around and around. And of course, one that we had talked about a few weeks ago, you know, about who is Ray, and I, I mean, it's been a topic right. ever since Force Awakens came right. out. But yet another sort of theory came out on HitFix, and you know, is Ray being set up as the as a villain? And I actually don't really want to talk about that. Like, is Ray a villain? I want to talk about, you know, why is Ray so interesting to people? Why is this, you know, like you said earlier, the 400th and, you know, right. why are we seeing so many theories about Ray? Why why is there this interest there about this character? What's going on in our psyche collectively as a 
pop culture psyche. Yeah. Why are we so drawn to her? Why are we creating all of these? Well, maybe it's this. Maybe she's this. Maybe this is going on. And so essentially the theory is Ray's being set up as a villain. And they give all these kind of decent to semi-lame to absolutely lame reasons why. Creatively done, though. Creatively done. Creatively done. But but I think why I'm saying it like that is I'm just so tired of it. Um, but what I'm not tired of is why we're feeling compelled to keep creating these things. Mm. Um, because so, she's the new Luke Skywalker. She, but is it just that? <sighs> is it just she's the new Luke? Because I no no, no it, I think I think it goes well beyond that. I think first and foremost, she better not effing be a villain. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I will be done if that's the case. You you said that with some emotion there. Done. Yeah. Wow. D U N, my friend. Done. <laughs> um. No. Here here's I think the the what makes us want to know more about Ray. Yeah. They the writers have purposefully placed her character as an enigma. They have purposely given us little bits and pieces to tease. Her background, yeah, but not given us enough about it. Whereas with Luke, right, we find him on this desert planet, and it's just we kind of we assumed a lot of stuff. But with these flashbacks and things with Ray, and this Force Vision thing with Ray, we're given all these little clues that we're just scrambling to try to put together. We yeah. never had that mm, in mm -hmm. in previous versions of this, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the other thing is her mystery is a central part of the entire storyline. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. Like we've got Boba Fett that has this cult following, but such a, a background character. And yeah, there's yeah. speculation and it was like, ooh, who was he? Who like, was he? When, right? the, when it was just the original trilogy, right, right before prequels. Yeah. But, but yeah. at the same time, it was like it didn't seem like essential that we wanted to know. To the story arc. Exactly. Oh, but okay. now with Ray, especially if she turns out to be a baddie, right? Like <laughs> oh. her, her background, her lineage, her pedigree. Yeah is central. Mm. And so I think that that's part of is just trying to figure out what on earth her backstory is. Yeah. I think the other part of that, part B, is the fact that we have a completely compelling character mm. even without the mystery of yeah. the background. I yeah. think we have a strong female figure who is not a Mary Sue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that that in and of itself, she has a great blend of toughness and innocence and savvy about her that yeah. is very compelling. Yeah. And Daisy really just knocks it out of the park with that. Yeah. So it's this big kind of like concoction maybe of things, because I do agree, like there is this Luke Skywalker aspect, except she's going on the heroine's journey, which, right. you know, is a little bit different from the hero's journey. Maybe a future episode, we need to talk about that. Um, that there is some variations in the right. literature about the heroine's journey as opposed to the hero's journey. Right. Um, but it, it's this weird, funky combination of this performance by this actress, right? The story that they've put together, what you said, Barb, is just this Luke connection, and like she is sort of the central hero or heroine, right? Um, but it is sort of a perfect storm when you well, start to really look at. Well, it. Well, that's just that's just it. Like what I mean by she's the new Luke Skywalker, I mean like all encompassing. Everything that Devin said, mm -hmm. um, the fact that right now she's the one that we're following. When we saw Luke for the first time in 1977, his character was nowhere near as complex as who Ray is. Yeah, but right. as the series went on, sure. us being newbies to the whole Star Wars yeah. universe to begin with, we found out a lot more complexity to Luke, right. especially his backstory. Right, yeah. So now we're coming into this new series with this new character we know how Star Wars works a lot more than when we saw Luke for the first time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we know that there's a backstory behind her, the way that they've set it up, but not just that. Based on what we know of Star Wars, there's way more to Rey than what we thought of Luke in the first movie. Mm -hmm. No so, question. Huh. So I, I just say she's the new Luke Skywalker, but there's a lot more to her. There's... I can't wait to find out, but I think that a lot of our speculation about her can get a bit too much. There was I, I didn't catch this, but but the the guys over at, at Star Wars Underworld on their most recent podcast, they were they were talking about an interview with Daisy Ridley, 
and they were playing some of the audio. And I don't know who was that. I have to find it. I, I literally was listening to it on the drive over to the studio. Um, great podcast. You guys should listen to it if you have never listened to Star Wars Underworld. But they were, they were talking uh, – they were playing and talking about um, – this interview with Daisy Ridley about Ray and they were asking her questions about episode eight. And they're like, we just want to ask yes or no, yes or no questions. And, and the first one was really interesting because she gave a, a yes, but I think she self-corrected and every other answer was maybe after that. Interesting. Um, but they asked her, you know, does, does um, Ray get wounded? And she said, yes. And then she kind of, and in this conversation, she added this caveat emotionally or physically it could be one or the other mm. you know or both like she right. was playing with the right. with the interviewer right but this is the type of thing i'm talking about mm-hmm. i don't want to know this yeah. stuff yeah i want to see it unravel in the movie yeah well i think i think that that tidbit i think there are fans that don't want to hear that i don't mind that because that's sort of expected of act two right um not the planet act <laughs> two sorry <laughs> Southerner in me just now, kind of popped out. Now I'm <laughs> not Ock to act to. That, there's no difference in that. I just realized. All right. So so I think here's another important thing, though. I just yeah. want to throw this in there is, although he may have said this about mm-hmm. other Star Wars characters, John Williams has said that he wants to be the only one to score Ray. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that like he's that, never said that about a character. Well, I don't. Never from, to my knowledge. No. And that's it. Never from a recollection of any interview that I've seen, read, heard, whatever yeah. else. And so. I'm so compelled to think that there is something even more magical about her Mm -hmm. than we Mm -hmm. even think that there is. Well, even the way he has scored her, there's almost a mystery behind that music whenever (laughs) you hear it. There's this tantalizing little bit that he does. Yeah, and hints at something more. Right. You know, and and that's the brilliance of Williams. And and the more we listen to the score of The Force Awakens, it it just kind of keeps unfolding for us. And uh, and I thought you know uh, Kylo Ren's music was, his theme was is to me is is as compelling but that's for another conversation another time but you know Ray we've talked about her so much mm-hmm. there's been I would say more than half of our podcasts have had a conversation or a tidbit about the character of Ray and and outright I think we've devoted multiple podcasts to the character right I, it's like they've caught whether they planned it or not it's lightning in a bottle. And they have this, like you were talking, you both were talking about. It's this compelling actress with this compelling character with mystery that is compelling. And we talked about mystery in a previous podcast, and right. why why is it so good for storytelling? And it's just all these things together. And I think what because people are captivated by the character, there's just this deep desire to know her. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that she seems relatable to some extent. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Something that, that's approachable. And I think just building on something that Barb had brought out is, you know, with the original trilogy, mm-hmm. a lot of it was going forward and having to do some backfilling. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, the great example is like the relationship with Luke and Leia. Yeah. Oops, wrong turn. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. But now we've got this dedicated story group and they're mapping things out from now until well into the future. Yeah. And so I believe that there's already a roadmap for this character Mm -hmm. where they understand exactly where they're taking us, where we didn't necessarily have that with the original trilogy. True. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see with this character's future and destiny already mapped out how we respond when it's actually unveiled to us. Yeah. Well, Ray is someone definitely that that is unlike. So, like, yes, she she has some comparisons to Luke, um, but there's so much because of the just the 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 mystery there, right? And people keep going back to these hints of is there evil in her background? Is, right. is she evil? Will she be evil? And no. <laughs> yeah, please no. Yeah, I I wouldn't. I prefer no. I don't mind like wrestling with the dark side like Luke. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't want to see her become this murderous character like like Anakin. Right. Like I don't want to see that. Um But what if she were to find out like Luke that her ancestry is mm-hmm. from the dark side? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe she's not evil, but she has to fight the evil from mm-hmm. her family. Yeah, maybe. At I, the I, end of the day, so long as she's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need. Uh, I need this, people. I need this. Yeah. I want to believe. Yeah. 
Oh man. Oh well. Hey. Oh, oh well. <laughs> do, you, do you guys? It's hear, just a movie. Do you hear that? Wait. What? Oh, Whoa. I I think it's time for some Death Star facts. Woo! made by the rebels against this station would be a useless gesture, no matter what technical data they've obtained. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Well, this is Death Star Facts, and so in the lead-up to Rogue One, we've dusted off one of the old Death Star technical companions from the West End Games role-playing game. You just happened to have that line around, did you, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. The same with the Death Star sound effects. So um, I want to share with you, as I was, I so I, I bought this used on Amazon.com for eight bucks. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and... Uh, it came prime, which was great. So fantastic. Eight dollar purchase. Love it. I used to play the Western Games role playing game all the time. And I used to actually own this, um, but gave it away. That's for another story wow. for another time. Sad, sad story. Wow. Um Yeah. I, I hope the person you bought it from is the person you originally gave it to. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Tate, if you're listening to this, let me know how my Western Games role playing game collection's doing. So Tate, Tate I gave everything I had to Tate. Oh my gosh. Was this around the time you got married? <laughs> yeah, it was. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I was yeah. around that time. All around right. that time. Good to know. Yeah, better man, better wow. future. All right. So, um, yeah. So, I, just opening this, it literally is about, uh, you know, a 60, 70, 80 page book that is just chock full of just data yeah. on on yeah. on the Death Star. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I was uh, flipping through it. And, in, you know, with Rogue One coming out, I thought it would be good to talk about the Death Star a little bit. And obviously, right. this is not all canon, but. We have been in different in different venues. We've heard different people, whether in the story group or with Lucasfilm or whatever, they've said that the West End Games has been so inspirational mm. and helped with their storytelling. Yeah. And a lot of these guys actually worked on the West End Games stuff. And I just want to read off some of the stats for the Death Star. I think that's just – I'm a stats guy. And so baseball fans out there, you'll enjoy this. But um, so Death Star Battle Station, here's some of their stats. And this is just – it's all sorts of rad. Um, it's its diameter is 120 kilometers. I can you convert that for me? <laughs> no, please? I can't. 120 kilometers would be about 75 miles. Mm -hmm. The Canadian comes through. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I'm looking at them now. 74.5645. Wow. I could not have gotten more close. <laughs> wow. That's good. Um, Here's some, here's some other here's some other facts and statistics. It's just mind boggling. So the officers, the number of officers on board the Death Star, yeah, is twenty seven thousand forty eight officers. Wow. Troops, pilots, crew, 774,576. Yes, West End Games brought it. All right, next. Support personnel. I guess it's the janitors of the Death Star? Yes. 378,000 of these people. Wow. Personnel. So it's not droids. Stormtroopers, there are 25,984 stormtroopers on board the Death Star. Seems a little low to me. <laughs> Um, they have 3,600 assault shuttles, 2,840 blast boats. I mean, the list goes on and on, but here's here's some of the fun things. If that wasn't fun for you, here we go. Um, they have 5,000 turbo laser batteries. Okay, pause. Star. Pause. Yes. How many of them are actually accurate? <laughs> <laughs> Two. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> the ones that got Jack Porkins. Yeah. All right. So um, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I have a problem here. Eject. I can hold it. No, you've been shot. All right. So um, there's that. Now that's just turbo laser batteries. There's five thousand heavy turbo lasers. Mm. Uh huh. Yep. And then twenty five hundred laser cannons. But here's here's some of my my favorite ones. <laughs> There are 768 tractor beam emplacements. Well, hello, sugar. Yep, yep. And then wow. you just have one super laser. Just one. And it's literally called super, super laser. laser. It literally is listed in the Death Star 
technical companion as wow. super laser. Uh, that's pretty awesome. The Death Star is such a fun thing in like pop culture. And I'm glad we get, and just seeing it like have the eclipse in the trailer. I mean, that's just so awesome. And ah, to be back on the Death Star, <laughs> fun memories. <laughs> the, the the bad part about this, of course, is with my OCD, I'm going to mm. be watching a Rogue One and all these numbers are going to be cycling through my mind, thanks to you. <laughs> That's what I'm here for, man. Hey, thanks next week, I'm going to bring more goodies for oh, you. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> great. Oh, great, man. Great, man, when you sit next to me in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our Death Star facts. We'll come back again to this next week and I'll read another page of Death Star facts for us. Wow. Yeah. So, hey, there's a, a documentary coming out. Uh, called the Prequels Strike Back. You can actually yeah, go on yeah. the on the internet at prequelsstrikeback.com and, and take a look at this film that's coming out. It's coming out relatively soon, like on digital DVD. It's September 14th, and then there's a theatrical premiere on October 6th. And here's the blurb on their website just about what it is and, and what, what's coming out. And it basically says the following, the Star Wars prequel trilogy is the most debate, debated chapter in cinema's greatest franchise. But what if moviegoers were only examining the films from a certain point of view? I see what they did there. Mm -hmm. Filled with commentary from passionate fans and scholars of cinema, the prequel Strike Back follows the travels of a be bewildered fan as he attempts to unlock the method behind cinema's most controversial trilogy and George Lucas, the even more controversial man behind them. He must unlearn what he has learned and look at the polarizing saga like never before. And it was actually, I think, crowdfunded film. Uh, and so, you know, uh, all, all this money is coming from fans wanting to see this project happen. It's happened. It's been made. It's coming out soon. You can go on their website and check out the the trilogy. But I, I wanted to to just, is this something you would like to see? I'm curious just what, as fans of Star Wars, is this just seeing the the trailer and just thinking about is this something where you're like yeah I would like to I would like to watch this is it compelling I absolutely guess. yeah yeah is there why though I guess is what I'm asking well I think for me here's kind of the the crux behind this and that yeah. is after talking to you and reading uh, Cast Sunstein's book yeah right yeah. World According to Star Wars I came away with a strong desire to get to better know the prequels and in fact. Dare I say I'm I'm even considering removing the term prequels, yeah, yeah. from associating the, the first three films, right? Yeah, or yeah. episodes one, two, and three. And I think that it between my conversation with him and and reading reading his book really left me having an, an appreciation for what did go right with those. Mm -hmm. And I think what did go right, at least for me, was the thematic elements that we yeah. see from. You know, a much more macro pulled back view mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that have really helped the story overall. Yeah, and for me, so that that's what it comes down to. It, it's a, a greater appreciation for what it brings to the overall story. Yeah, yeah. I think it'll be interesting to hear the perspective from those who grew up with the prequels mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because our generation grew up with the original series. Mm -hmm. And so we have that bias when we watch the prequels. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the ge generation that grew up who were five, six, seven, when those prequels were coming out, that's their star Wars, as you said, Jeremy. Yeah. And so their perception and experience is going to be much different than ours. Right. So it'll be interesting to hear that in this documentary and, see it from a different point of view. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what... The, I think this is actually a good thing mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I would I don't know how long ago it came out, but, like, I think it was a documentary called The People versus George Lucas. And it, I think it might still be on, like, Amazon Prime. And at one point it was on Netflix, like, it was, like, where you can stream it. And it was basically the, the generation that were kids when the originals came out right. just pissing and moaning about the prequels. And right. that, that was all it was. In fact, we didn't get to hear in that documentary the dissenting voice saying, well, wait a minute. Like, this is like, – let's take another look at the prequels. And I would admit I was full into that camp. I mean, I – you know, I, I went and saw the prequels a ton – but there How many was times you see Phantom Menace? <laughs> How many? In the theater, I saw Phantom Menace 11 times. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. Welcome to our 12-step program. 
<laughs> so, but I liked them. They weren't the original trilogy to me. Right. Like I didn't have the same emotional reaction to them. Although I would say episode three hit some moments mm. that made me feel in a way that was similar to the original trilogy. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say, but, and then here's the thing, the force awakens definitely made me feel original trilogy, but that was their intention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I started hearing of the ring theory, and we've talked about it a little bit on the show, and the ring theory that that Lucas is using to use to make the films. And I don't know how much on record he's gone talking about that, but it's definitely something people are picking up on and seeing and making reference to. I think this documentary goes into that a little bit. Right. Um, but I would say over the last – since doing the podcast really – um, and hearing and being exposed to all these different perspectives of of the prequels, going back and and rewatching the Clone Wars animated series, which I think adds a ton to the prequel trilogy. Uh, I've really I'm I'm singing a different tune. They're still not my favorite films. If I had to rank them, they're they're you know episode three's up there, right? Uh, but one and two isn't as as highly ranked as the other films, and I think all fans have their own rankings, but. Um, I definitely have noticed this changing in perception. And it actually, I want I want to take this and lead it into more of a closer look segment today. And this is kind of where we're going, is that, you know, our perceptions, our opinions about Star Wars, about characters in Star Wars in general, in life in general, yeah. they change as we age, as we have experiences. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to dig in a little bit more of these ideas of our own changing perceptions and perspective, especially when it comes to Star Wars. We'll be right back. Unmistakably Star Wars. So as we age, as we have life experiences, tragedy, successes, our perceptions of things, they they can change around us. Right. And as fans of Star Wars, um, that those basic same concepts apply. And we find our, our perceptions and opinions changing about the saga. So I wanted to explore this idea a little bit. And, and I wanted to throw out just a few concepts First, before we dig into like the actual Star Wars story, just about, um, you know, how do people change their opinion? What has to happen? Yeah. And I would say there might be a difference in terms between I'm changing my opinion versus I'm changing my perception or my perspective. But I wanted to throw out there was a, a few tidbits here. There was an article on psychology today. Where And this is a quote from an article dealing with, like, changing opinion. And it, it says – here's a quote from the article. It says, um, but, but why do we cling to our views so tenaciously after they are formed? Um, interesting clues come from two areas of study, self-affirmation and cultural cognition. Both areas suggest that we cling to our views because the walls of our opinions – are like battlements that keep the good guys inside us safe from the enemy without all those dopes with different opinions than ours. Quite literally, our views and opinions may help protect us, keep us safe, literally help us survive. Small wonder, then, that we fight so hard to keep those walls strong and tall. And so I, I found that really just an interesting jumping off point. It's actually really hard to change, like, an opinion about something, especially if you're in a, a cultural group that's that's sizable, right. that's sharing that same kind of view or opinion. Um, and so if someone is, like, a, a diehard, like, original trilogy guy – it might be really hard to say the, no. The prequels are on the same level as the original trilogy, and and so because everyone around you is is thinking similarly to you, and you're not listening or having even opportunities, maybe even to listen to some someone else. Um, the other thing is this mention in the quote of cultural cognition, and I want to just talk about that theory a little bit. It, it's a theory that that we shape our opinions to conform to the views of the groups with which we most strongly identify. 
that does two things. It creates solidarity in the group, which increases the chances that our group's views will prevail in society. And we see this in political in politics all the time and right. with political parties. Um, and it strengthens the group's acceptance of us as members in good standing. And so we even see, again, this is very, we can actually see this in sort of the political landscape right now. Right. Um, but, you know, there's, so there's this idea of changing opinion, but there's also just the idea of perception change. And, and I wanted to throw out two films that, that the change in perception has been really noticeable. And then once I do that, I think we can go in and start talking about Star yeah. Wars. But, but we have seen this happen. And in, in the late 1960s, 2001, A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick came out. Right. And there's a story I love. And I think it was, I think it was Rock Hudson, of all people, is, is sitting down front premiere of Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. He gets up midway and he basically says, this is ridiculous and like walks out of the film. Right. And if you've seen 2001, A Space Odyssey, yeah, it's different. It's a different film. And it wasn't universally loved. It wasn't universally praised. In fact, a lot of people said it was the most ridiculous thing they had ever seen. Um, Blade Runner was similar. It didn't do well at the box office. People were just kind of dismissive of it. Right. And, you know, Harrison Ford was in it. Ridley Scott was doing it, who made Alien. Um, people were sort of excited, but it, it just didn't catch. Right. And both films, years later, are now universally praised as probably the two best science fiction films ever made. Hmm. And uh, originally, they weren't thought of that way. Right. And it's interesting. I'm not saying we're seeing the exact same shift with the prequels, yeah. but I do think we're starting to see somewhat of a shift where people are saying, no, 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 there's more going on than I thought it f- – there's more going on than Jar Jar stepping in poop. Like there's more happening. Right. And I think what happened is a lot of people saw the Jar Jar and poop moments and they defined Star Wars as that. Or define the prequels as that. Yeah, yeah. But as time has passed and more people have kind of viewed it and thought about it and reflected on it and co- more conversations have happened and the voice of the children that saw the prequels are starting to speak up more, I think a lot more fans in general are, are listening, hopefully, right. and saying, okay, I'll, I'll take another look at it. So um, here's my question to you guys, because I know just in our conversations, perceptions have changed. And characters that we loved and when we were young, we still love them. But there are characters that we didn't love when we were young that we now adore. Right. And there's scenes that had a certain – we looked at them with a certain perspective. But as we've had our own life experiences, we look at different scenes differently. Sure. And, and so I guess my question is this. you know, How have your perceptions changed – about Star Wars over the years. And we can talk about characters. We can talk about specific movies, um, even specific scenes. But I, I want to throw it to you guys and like, and just ask that basic question. Like, what, what perceptions have changed the most for you concerning Star Wars? Yeah, fantastic question. I think first going back to even talking about the whole cultural cognition yeah. and, and the self-affirmation, I think that, you know, as I was mulling this over preparing for the show, I was reminded about those times in my life where my perspective did change. Not Star yeah. Wars related stuff, yeah, yeah. but just life related stuff. Yeah. And I think the two things that often led most to the change were moments that for whatever reason it was it was a familiar setting but in a different context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that could have been because of age, could have been because of the actual people in there, whatever else. And the other part of it was, I think, maybe part B to that is a willingness to take a closer look mm. or a different look yeah. or a reexamination. Yeah, yeah. And so I think going back in terms of episodes one, two, and three, um, yeah, I think I've got different perspectives on it as a whole. Yeah. If we're taking it as – not episodes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but as Star Wars. Yeah. I think that my perspective changed fairly dramatically. Mm. And in particular to those first three, one, two, and three. Yeah. Yeah. Because the macro themes were fleshed out and maybe not how I wanted it to happen, mm-hmm. but they were fleshed out and it gave us 
a more compelling storyline for four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that for me, not so much a particular scene, but the overall thematic arc was much better fleshed out when taken yeah. as as a whole work. Yeah. Yeah. Barb, what are some of your, your thoughts just on the, this basic well, question? It's just interesting listening to you guys. And as I was thinking about it beforehand, you know, I was trying to go back to that time when all I had was episode four, five, and six. Yeah. You know, watching that, trying to remember how I felt about Luke. Like you, you know, having seen the trilogy that Luke has a history because Darth Vader is his dad. Yeah. But there's not anything filling that. And now that I watch the original trilogy, which I I still love more than the prequels. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I dislike the prequels, but now that I watch them having the backstory yeah, of the yeah. prequels, it's right. changed a lot of how I view the characters that I've always loved. And um, Luke specifically and Leia, they just, they have a lot more dimension to them. There's a lot more behind it. And then in referring to the prequels and, you know, the perception that we have that it wasn't that great or um, trying to understand how people are giving it credit, I give it a lot of credit. There's yeah, so yeah. much in there, as you were saying, when you get past the ridiculous moments that is Star Wars, as Devin said. It's not the prequels. There, It's it's one encompassing story. And it makes me wonder how people are going to refer to this new trilogy, hmm. you know, because we've got the original trilogy. We've got the prequels. Well, right. now we have episode seven, eight, and nine. Is it all going to just be Star Wars? What are we hmm. going to refer to that as? Right. And how is that trilogy going to affect our perspective of our original trilogy? It, it's thrilling questions. I want to throw something into this kind of conversation just just not only for our listeners, but for you, for both of you, uh, the Star Wars show that StarWars.com does, you know, they have their YouTube channel. They, this past week, it's actually, I would say over the last several weeks, they've been doing sort of, here's our extra footage from all of that. Yeah. And uh, the filmmaker, Kevin Smith, who's, who's a diehard yeah. Star Wars fan, right. who has fame, that famous scene in Clerks from 1994, I think, where they talk about the Death Star and right. like in Return of the Jedi and like all these innocent people that died. Great scene, great moment, but like that was in the dark times of Star Wars. Right. You know, we're we're grabbing hold of whatever we can get a, a hold on. There's just there yeah. wasn't that much Star Wars. Yeah. But Smith was was on recently on the Star Wars show um, that that's on YouTube, and it was fascinating because um, they they put out sort of their extra, mm -hmm. and there was a conversation between them where Smith was actually commenting on the prequels and he said he, he was talking to um, um, the Rebels, Clone Wars, uh, Dave Filoni and he was talking to Dave Filoni and Filoni, he, Smith said Filoni just blew his mind Sure, and, 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 and how to view the prequels and he, and he said the following, Smith said the following, he said, uh, go back and watch the prequels as the Jedi's failure hmm. and look at it through that lens of hmm. it's just how the Jedi failed. Right. And it's these new heroes in the original trilogy that sort of write the ship. Yeah. Um, but, but the prequels is all about the failure of the Jedi yeah. order. Interesting. And when you start to watch it through that lens where I'm watching about the failure of this group, this yeah. religious group, it's compelling. Right. And when he said that, I was like, it was like a little switch went off in my head. I'm hmm. like, I just started thinking of scenes differently. And, you know, I'm like, I need to go rewatch these, like right. really sit down and look at these again. So I thought that was really, really an interesting thought. I, I'm i curious for you, have there is there really a distinct character that you didn't pay much mind to previously, but now when you see them, it's a different deal. Like they're they're much more compelling to you. Uh, that there is something about them that intrigues you or, you know, because right now everyone's high on Ray. Right. Um, but I'm curious as in like 15 to 20 years, is there a character in The Force Awakens 
that people will look at differently. And may, and mm-hmm. we have to see the whole arc, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, who knows? Kylo Ren might be one of those characters where we're like, he might be one of the best characters in the whole saga. Right. You know, because of his the complexity to him. Right. Uh, for me, there's two that I can go to, and, and everyone knows that I love Obi-Wan Kenobi. But when I was a kid, teenager, early 20s, Obi-Wan of episode four was... Like, yeah, I liked him, but I didn't – like, he wasn't my favorite that he is now. Right. And we we had an article on, on the site recently about Obi-Wan and his long suffering, mm-hmm. and you did that mentor series about right. Obi-Wan, Devin. And um, as you as I've gotten older, I'm a teacher now. I've been teaching for, you know, 12 years. Um, I'm in my 40s. I have kids. You know, right. there are things that Obi-Wan Kenobi does, not only in the prequels, but – but and the prequels actually help um, – the a new hope Obi Wan a ton it is Obi Wan's just a totally different character to me. Right. He's not this guy that just kind of like like dies at the hand of Darth Vader. That was like you know you said it when we were talking pre show. You know it's like this this where'd you dig up this old fossil? Yeah, and I think exactly. when I was a kid I looked at him as this old fossil, right. and um, now he's I love him. Yeah. Like I love this character, right. and I I adore his characteristics and traits to the point where I'm like I. I would hope that I could be a long suffering person. Right. And and uh he's one and then not far is Qui Gon. Hmm. I loved Qui Gon. He's a great character, but but now as I've gotten older, I really, really like Liam Neeson's portrayal of Qui Gon Jinn. Hmm. Uh I've liked the little brief snippets we got of him in the Clone Wars. Um, but I would say those two characters as a man and as I'm getting older. I, I'm tending to look at other men that are aging or mm-hmm. aged right. and, and seeing how they deal with the hard things in life, not yeah. only in like my pop culture, but just in general. And uh, those two guys have been really, really compelling. And, and, and now with all that said, you know, my favorite characters, like favorite, favorite is probably Obi-Wan. Ray is probably in that conversation. Mm-hmm. So it's not just male yeah. dominated, but right. as I've looked at like a huge shift over who I – like appreciated and like those two radically have changed for yeah. me. Um, I feel Qui Gon's death a lot more than I did when I saw it on the screen the first mm. time. So, mm. um, what about you guys? Are there characters that have really radically changed for you in terms of your appreciation of them or your perspective? Well, I mean, I don't want to focus on the obvious, but Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what What was great about the original trilogy is his redemption at the end. Yeah. Even yeah. before the prequels ever came out, it gave us a sympathy for him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Like, thank God that he was redeemed because yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah. But the prequels have compounded that mm. so much because... You knew when you found out that he was Luke and Leia's dad, you knew that he had to have some kind of love or romance. Mm-hmm. The prequels have put a person to that, yeah. you know, um, through Padme and Anakin and their whole history mm. and who Anakin was. I think Revenge of the Sith portrayed Anakin the best, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. just to get that understanding of who he was right before yeah. he turned to the dark side. So when you see the original trilogy now, Darth Vader is definitely one for me that mm. you just have a lot more feeling for him and seeing him obeying the emperor and going through everything. It's just a different perspective. That's a great point. You know, in fact, you know, just thinking about that and talk about the the value importance and worth of the prequels is when you watched a new hope before the prequels and Darth Vader steps onto the, you know, to the, the Corellian blockade runner, the Tanty of four, I guess. Right. Um, when he steps on, you know, he is, I need to be careful. He's, he's almost like this kind of like, nightmare character like mm-hmm. he's just a, a, a Jason Voorhees Friday the 13th stalk right. you down kill you terrify I mean he's terrifying but now when he steps on you see that history you exactly. see Anakin you see his transformation into the suit and there's so much more stepping on to that ship than just this scary looking guy in a black suit. And so th- I find that that stuff very interesting it makes a lot of sense to me. And not only that but you see his progression from the dark mm-hmm. on the dark side when yeah. when you've seen the prequels and then you see him step on that ship at the beginning of a new yeah. hope it's like anakin's powers have tripled 
as yeah. a Sith Lord, yeah. just yeah. in that one scene and his confidence as being a Sith Lord. Yeah, well, and and then I, who knows what Rogue One's going to add to all this. Right. I know. I don't think we're going to get an hour of Vader. You know, most likely it's a 10, 15 minute mm-hmm. kind of chunk, but uh, I think it's going to even add to that perception or perception change. So, yeah. Well, definitely. and I think that that's part that, that has played into me as, as well as far as my perception on, on the various characters. But we often turn to Obi-Wan as the man who makes the sacrifice, mm-hmm. right? Who mm-hmm. willingly gives up himself because, you know, if he gets struck down, he's going to become more powerful than, than yeah. Vader can possibly imagine. But it wasn't until going back and trolling through the previews that I really started to to think that he's not the only one. Mm, and I think that point. Anakin was long suffering mm-hmm. and he became Vader for the ultimate good deed to save his wife. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think we, we often see it as he went to the dark side. Yeah. True. But his intentions were yeah. to save his wife. It's a lot more complex than a first glance. Right. I think a lot of people had that first glance at it and were like, oh, okay, yeah, right. yeah, he just went to the dark side. But there's there's a lot going on. Right. Uh, uh, you know, in his psych- psychology, you know, and, and why he's doing what he's doing. Well, right and, and who, who amongst us here, like at this mm-hmm. table right now, all having families, yeah. wouldn't do whatever it took to keep our families safe. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. even that line in Bloodline that Leia is having near the end of the book of what could have compelled her father to mm. turn to the dark dark side and could it have been a motive of good right. yeah. and she was having more understanding and sympathy right. for who because she was, was feeling that way too exactly. in that moment yeah that's yeah. the brilliance of Bloodline and you know uh you know we see a lot of these characters that uh, as time passes and as more little tidbits are put into the story i think that's what makes star wars so brilliant it's like we have Rogue One coming out. It's going right. to add to these characters, right? You know, add to the canvas, I guess, right? Uh, and I think we're going to continue to get that. And you may, I think you said it earlier, Barb. Just like I wonder what seven, eight, nine are going to do to these other films. Mm-hmm. How are they going to change our perspectives? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think, I think one of the neat things about Star Wars is that our opinions, our perceptions, our perspectives, they're, they are changing. There's this evolving going on. And I guess that could happen with all sorts of films. I, I just, as I think about the films I love, there hasn't been a lot of that. Like, I, I maybe a little change. But if anything, it's more just a disinterest because I've seen it so many times. But <laughs> yeah, with Star Wars, I it's like, I, I would, I want to go back. I want to kind of dig around a little bit more and, and think maybe differently about it. There's a lot more going on. Well, and I think that that is where I would yeah. just touch on is instead of being so locked into rank them for me or which mm. one is your favorite. Yeah. I, I think instead of being so micro-focused, you have to take a step back and see the mosaic yeah. for, for its yeah. full self. Yeah. And not until you can actually see it as a holistic piece can you really start to understand its inner workings, Yeah, right? Yeah. Or appreciate it to its fullest. I'm, I'm curious though, you know, we're talking about that macro. Right. Is, is there, in terms of scenes, have they are do they play differently for you now? As you as as we all have gotten older and we've had life experience, children, you know, um, different jobs, moves. I mean, tragedies in our lives. Yeah. Um, are there scenes in the films that resonate with you, or you look at a little bit differently now than you did maybe when they were released in the theater? I think the scene, the classic scene, right with yeah. Luke looking off into the sunsets. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think as a young man, I saw that as what's ahead. Yeah. I think as an older man, it's kind of more like literally looking at a sunset. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I mean, totally like, get it though. Right? I, yes, yeah, yeah. You're just like it's a beautiful freaking sunset. Yeah, but it, but it, but it's. <laughs> I'm but it's sorry. Also, yeah. You're a jerk. <laughs> Total jerk. I was having a serious moment. Okay, there. sorry. Rewind. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm serious. My smile's gone. Eleven times, Jolly fan of Minnesota. Oh, yeah. All right. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Gosh, no, but it's like right when you yeah. get to when you get to midlife or later, it's yeah. the sunset. You're no longer looking at as the young farm boy. Yeah. What's out there? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. more looking at it like it's coming closer to the end of my personal sunset. Like a sunset. Yeah, yeah. Right. Not just like the literal like a right. of but, sun's but going as, down. Yeah. As, as the sun yeah. sets on on me as a, as a person, right? Yeah. You 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 tend to kind of be more reflective than you are 
hopeful looking forward. Oh, I think you nailed it. Uh, that idea of of hopeful looking forward versus reflection. Right. And you know, as we teach, you know, we teach juniors and seniors in right. high school right now. You know, it's it's looking ahead, man. Like yeah. our, my seniors are already, yeah, <laughs> already looking to graduation. Yeah. You know, and you know, whereas I I I look back at past classes and reflect on them and right. like reflect on you know where they're at and right. what's going on in their lives and and with and with sunsets are interesting because we have the one in episode three, yeah. Uh, where Padme is looking at the, the, you know, where Anakin is and then vice versa. Right. And Anakin's making this like heart wrenching decision, which we just alluded to, like, what do I need to do right. to save my wife and my unborn child? At that right. time he didn't, I don't right. think he knew it was twins. Um, so it, it's just, you know, I think there are scenes where we, we do change how we see it. We do look at it differently. I think, you know, it's interesting how I view the older characters hmm. in in a much more I don't dismiss them right away. And yeah. I think in, in our in, in at least in the in somewhat in our culture, in American culture, and I know it's different in others, but there is a, at times a dismissal of the elderly or a dismissal of someone that is much older than you. But, you know, looking at characters like Yoda hmm. and, you know, and talking about how these characters are being there, there's adding on to them with rebels and clone wars right. and the films and new films. And, right. you know, you know, but Yoda's admission in rebels this past season that they were prideful hmm. and that, you know, they gave into the dark side. Right. It, that like it's it's sometimes hard to be an older person and, and admit failure. It's, it's hard right. for anyone. But but it makes me love Yoda even more that that I know that he sees what's mm. ha what happened right. and and he's admitting that and you know for him I I love him even more and it even plays into that whole long suffering he was long suffering too in some right. aspects I right. know he's much older than Obi Wan right uh, but you know he goes to Dagobah and lives a solitary life you know right. and 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 training and communing with the Force maybe Qui Gon but you know it, right. it's it's fascinating how he's changed. I would say the scene that gets me that I think will change even more for me. Like if, if I'm looking ahead, yeah, I think the the scene that's really going to radically change for me is um, Ben killing Han. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Uh, I I just yeah. think I think it affects me now and my children. You know, my eldest is nine. Yeah. But I think when they're teenagers and and beyond, yeah. I think that scene's really going to take hold in a whole new way. And, yeah. and Devin, you have a son that's 21? 22. 22. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, we've talked about this before, but yeah. that scene kind of hits you, doesn't it? Like, Oh, without question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was certainly a, a rough patch in our relationship that it felt like that. <laughs> yeah. It felt like yeah. that. Yeah, 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 know? yeah. And that absolutely is something that I can look to and 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 – have a unique emotional connection yeah. with that particular scene. Just the way Harrison Ford plays that, you know, and I, I, I think mothers probably can relate to it as well, you know, is how we'll, we'll, if we need to die to save our kid, to bring them back from a dark place, right. we'll do it. Right. And it's just, there's a tragedy with that scene that is, to me, it's not a Maul killing a Qui-Gon. Right. Mm -mm. It's, it's not a Darth Vader, you know, letting or taking Obi-Wan to wherever Obi-Wan goes in the force, right? You know, right. Uh, it, it's not, <sighs> Vader's death is the is probably one of the closest. Mm. You know, Anakin's death at the end of Return of the Jedi, uh, that same feelings right. played out for me. Yeah. And, and uh, but those are the only two scenes that I, that I find similar in that way. Yeah. And I guarantee, I know for a fact that the, that Vader, Anakin's death in Return of the Jedi that's a whole different ball game for me right. now oh, than yeah. it was in 83. Right. Yeah. Like it's a totally, oh, sure. it's a, I was so focused on Luke. Right. Now I'm so focused on, on Vader and you know, his, how his love for his son brought him back from such a dark place. I, right. I just, that scene is so radically changed, but other thoughts just on, on this and, and your changing perspectives. Well, and stuff. what I find interesting, I just wanted to comment on is when you're talking about the older characters like Obi-Wan and Yoda, as yeah. they look back, it's going to be so interesting in episode eight to hear Luke yeah. and what he's gone through because now he's the older one. He's mm. the, 
he's the wise one but has made mistakes yeah. and it's just he looked wrecked at the end of the movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he has got a story and he has so much different perspective than what we remember him from the original trilogy yeah and that's a whole like conversation to have is you know you you said you know he looked wrecked you know, at the end of Force yeah. Awakens, I bet we'll see that scene differently by the end of nine. Well, I, you know what I mean. Like when Episode Nine ends, I bet when we look back at that moment with the full context, right, it'll change. I as always well. wonder too when you see Luke at the end of the movie. Now he's one with the Force. Does he already know what has happened to Han? Mm. And that's part yeah. of what I think about when I see his face is that maybe he knows what's going. He's on. known what has happened. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so so fun to. Talk about, and like you said, you know, our perceptions of Luke, which really haven't been touched yet. Yeah. He hasn't been touched. I mean, we had that moment in uh, the comic series, you know, leading up to The Force Awakens, Shattered Empire, issue four, you know, had Luke in it. And we saw some hints at him doing some things that were a little shocking where he like basically vaporizes all those Imperials with thermal detonators. and. You know, there's this moment like, where is he going? Like, what kind of path is he going down? But we, he hasn't really been touched. Right. And so we still sort of see Luke as Luke from four, five, and six. And I think that's going to radically change. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when eight, eight comes out. Yeah. And, and I think he'll, he might be one of the characters we see a lot of perception change happen with um, in the future. You know who my perception of hasn't changed? Lando, I still want to. <laughs> I still want to be him. <laughs> that hasn't changed in the last forty years. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, well, seriously though, like we talked about this recently, where yeah. like Lando's like, yeah, he's fun. He's kind of like a Han. Yeah. But as I've gotten older, I'm like, ah, he's pretty smooth. I'm yeah. not. I'm not saying like I figured out like our ages are the same now. Yeah. When he was an Empire, and I'm like. Billy D. Williams is so much cooler than me. Colt 45, baby. <laughs> it well, is. <laughs> we've got the Han movie coming out. Yes. Could he be in that? Well, that's the, know? there's a rumor yeah. of a casting rumor. So, yeah. so we'll see. But, uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that, that kind of wraps us up, but it, it's definitely something I think fans, the, this conversation fans can have, you know, and, and so what, what are your big perception changes? What are your, you know, big opinion changes over the films? Uh, you know, or characters or scenes or whatever it is. Um, we share with you ours. Why don't you share yours with us? Tweet at us at unmistakably SW. You can always follow us on Instagram at the same thing, unmistakably SW. We have some articles coming out this week, some today, uh, at unmistakablystarwars.com. But thank you so much for joining us and, and, and hanging out with us as we talk through these things. And as always, may the force be with you. Thanks for listening to Unmistakably Star Wars. Join us again next week for more news and insights like only we can bring you. Until then, lock the door and hope they don't have blasters. 